Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me uh, this afternoon to discuss how CSRA uses AWS big data and analytics services to deliver advanced solutions to our federal clients. And we do deliver a lot of data and analytic solutions to our clients. We use advanced analytics and big data to stop fraud, waste, and abuse, to explore the human genome, to protect our borders, to forecast spending. Um, data is everywhere in the federal space, and our teams have been building and deploying those solutions for a long time. I'm going to spend some time today talking about how AWS services get us to deploying those analytics faster. And that's the whole promise of the title. We're going to speed innovation. And I'm so excited to share these stories with you today. So welcome. Come on in and sit down. Okay. I'm getting the time in there. All right, so since the uh, dawn of federal IT, we've been creating data-centric solutions. And data-driven agencies, like the scientific agencies and um, social security and the rest, have created a lot of applications. Most of those applications uh, create their own data streams. In some cases, they might share data, but along the way, they might perturb that data. We might actually have the same data source that's examined two different ways. One's an aggregate and one's at a raw level. So you, we have all of these services, solutions, building data, but it's all stovepiped. And we're living in a data-driven era. Some people estimate that 2.5, IBM, some people, IBM, <laughs> estimates that 2.5 million terabytes of data are created every single day. It's 2.5 million terabytes every day, and that's growing. So next year, the figure might be 2.8 or 3 million terabytes per day. Unfortunately, our staffs are not growing at that exponential rate, not growing much at all. The people available with analytic skills are a relatively constant number, and we have this immense supply of data, and we have a constant supply of people. So at CSA, we partner with Amazon to leverage the Amazon Web Services to create solutions that address this um, stovepiped world of ever-increasing data and limited staff. Our solution is built on a secure platform to allow analysts to build innovative solutions and not build information, not build security infrastructure. And we leverage our, um, and, we, and we leverage the, the services available in AWS to get to solutions faster. Next slide. So our, our story today explores each of this, these solution components in our data analytic platform. Our secure platform meets federal security requirements. We have a data integration platform that can scale to store and meaningfully integrate exponentially growing data. We have a data analytics platform that can find hidden patterns, make predictions, and prescribe actions to actually impact missions. Think about that. We can predict what's going to happen, and we can describe actions to make an outcome more favorable if we can act on this data fast enough. So using AWS's service-based architecture, we do this in an elastic manner that um, leaves the undifferentiated lifting to AWS. So AWS provides the platform, and we provide these capabilities on top. This analytic platform enables today's workforce to leverage rapidly growing data assets. So now I'm talking about security. You might ask yourself, why is Dave speaking about security in a data analytics breakout session? Well, because we must. Because every day, it seems, Data and systems are compromised by cyber attacks. Most data scientists are uninterested and, frankly, not qualified to create and sustain a secure platform. So before we can safely analyze data, we need a platform in place with an authority to operate. This requirement is a barrier to many agencies, a significant barrier to some. So we looked at this problem and created a solution to providing a secure platform. Let me share how we overcame this problem with AWS.
We start by creating a secure, extensible platform. Our approach built on AWS's security services, IAM and security groups and all the available fundamentals. And then we extended that with an integrated security and integrated management frameworks that were compliant with NIST and FedRAP requirements. Doing this once, right? Where did we do this? We did this work at F, well, we did this work internally for CSRA when we joined our companies, but we also did this for our a main customer, the FAA. We wanted to help them develop a secure government community cloud to meet their goal of moving data and applications to the cloud. So beginning in late 2015, the FAA cloud services platform contract came out and we, and we um, began to execute. We provided cloud brokering, managed services, security as a service, and we created a FedRAMP certified um, integration of the cloud with FAA's existing data centers and services. So here we, we have accomplished for FAA what was a barrier. And the benefits are now we have a certified and agile, fully managed, secure cloud platform. How do we do this? Well, our cloud, our CSRA security and cloud architects leveraged the AWS shared responsibility approach to certification. And they began with a baseline reference architecture similar to this notional diagram shown here. I can't show you the FAA architecture, but it's similar in its um, scope and size. The architecture had three environments, dev, test, and production, and VPCs, each with a VPC, and direct connections between the FAA data centers and to a primary and a secondary co-location in the cloud. This means that data and applications can be hosted in FAA data centers and have access to cloud services all under the same consistent security boundary and controls. And further, this could be inherited by new work streams. So some of the additional features of our solution, this secure platform, include a CONOP for infrastructure security, a shared SOC security operations center, and some guidelines for how to procure cloud services to streamline acquisitions so that new workloads could start sooner and faster. So what were the impacts of the, um, the secure platform? Well, some of the lessons learned, you can see we, um, acquisition of services in the government, in the public sector is still kind of a new frontier. And so we developed guidelines, best practices, and a repeatable playbook to help uh, get our contracts, some reusable language actually, to get our contracts to be written so that we could acquire cloud services. The AWS shared responsibility model and, the FISMA and, and AWS's FISMA certifications were valuable assets on which we could build and we leveraged them for working on our certifications. And we used an agile approach to security engineering and compliance and that helped speed our certification. So the benefits are obvious. We can reuse this platform, new work streams can be accredited that much faster, and security as a service can be shared across the entire community cloud, making, uh, making for more economical and safe and consistent security. So now, with security firmly established, we can load and enrich and interrogate our exponentially increasing data, still, yet it's still stovepiped. So let's talk about how we can address that problem. In this story, we are going to build a data integration platform to tear down the walls. Our approach uses AWS infrastructure as a service, basically the store nodes and the compute nodes on which we hosted data, managed, data integration software, open source tools and big data tools. Apache, Hadoop, Hortonworks, Elasticsearch, and MongoDB. All of this ecosystem is designed to collect and store vast amounts of information in a distributed fashion so that we can scale up as more data is collected or consumed. So FAA made the move to the cloud in 2015 with that uh, FAA cloud services contract 
And they, as they began to move forward, we had some thought leaders at FAA that said, let's use this platform to store all of our FAA data. We don't have, at this point, the, um, the effort that began in 2016 went through a pilot phase, and it began by storing 20 large data sources with the goal of moving all of the FAA flight operations and safety uh, information into one, co one central location. In the end, it'll represent hundreds of data sources that are going to produce uh, tens of terabytes per day. Today, that data spills out on the floor. It's not persisted by the FAA consistently. Some sources are persisted, some are not. And third-party services actually consume some of that data and persist it for their own benefits and sell as commercial services. But FAA doesn't persist that own data. So this EIM, this Enterprise Information Management Solution, is meant to be that persistent store to make sure that we have all that data available for analysis and review. So the analytic features of the EIM, shown on the right, again, we're building on infrastructure from AWS using open source tools. We're using big data tools. We're able to batch load data and stream data. And we do all that to land and ingest, enrich, enrich, store, and serve that data for purpose, for analytical purposes. Again, we're on a secure platform. It's highly available in the cloud. So we don't have to, the application or the analytical developers don't have to worry about security. They don't have to worry about backup. They don't have to worry about disaster recovery. They, they are writing their data integration and their analytical applications. Let me give you an example of how this uh, can change. It can be a game changer. But at FAA, if you think about events, they're interested in flight safety events. They're all interested in delays and weather events and maintenance events, all kinds. But I'm going to talk about one, loss of separation. Um, loss of separation are when two planes are too close together. And it's an event that triggers um, an automatic report and an investigation. So what, the first thing that an analyst who's investigating a loss of service event needs to do is identify and collect and integrate the data that may have some explanatory component to it to help us understand what happened in that event. Now, if you think about what they're trying to do is analyze what happened, why did these planes lose separation, the first thing they have to do is spend about 80% of their time collecting data and harmonizing, integrating, collating, summarizing data, finding the data sources. So in general, it's an old expression, 80% of the time, are, or it's an old uh, statistic, 80% of the time spent collecting data only leaves 20% of the time to analyze data. So with this platform, we can have the data available and begin to investigate. For a loss of separation event, a flight track database might be helpful. Where did they fly? Weather data would be certainly helpful to understand if there were winds or clouds or rain or some other severity of, of weather that caused them to deviate from their flight track. Putting those two sources together, though, is just the start. If we're looking at what might cause a loss of, loss of separation event. We might want to hear what the, what the pilots said. Perhaps they um, planned to lose the separation for, to avoid some other dire event. Perhaps there were cloud tops in the area that obscured their visibility. They had to fly around some clouds. Hot, you, in the summer months, you've all seen those five mile high thunder clouds. They don't fly through those, they fly around those. Um, maybe the flight plan actually anticipated this route, or maybe it was a deviation from the flight plan. Perhaps the air traffic controllers told them to take an, an, a maneuver, to take an action. Maybe the sensors on the plane provided incomplete incom data, or maybe they ignored that data, or maybe it was overridden. And finally, perhaps there's a, some part of the plane that's known to be broken or needs repair or seems to be faulty in some way. So imagine having to go to six, seven, eight different databases, pull all that data down for one particular time and space, and then start your analysis. Significant amount of data preparation work.
So there has to be a better way, and there is. We built the EIM platform, and it has two public faces for the developer. It has a data mall, which collects 20 different data sets now. It's imagined and anticipated to collect hundreds. And those data sets are stored as is for federal requirements, legal requirements. But they're also enriched. They're tagged with geospatial information. They're um, indexed by, with search terms, so we can do text searches. They're actually indexed with a natural language tool, so we can do natural language search on that data. And in some cases, where data makes sense to be joined, they're actually collated at the point of entry into the system. So we'll have the source data, and we'll have the flight track information collated with the cloud information collated with the weather information. So we have a master data set on which analysts can do their work. So we kind of think through what makes, what's appropriate to join and keep as a data resource, make available in the data mall. Data is only, only useful if you analyze it, right? So the counterpart to this is our application mart. The app mart hosted 15 tools. Some of them are Apache tools like Hive and and uh, pig so that you, you can query the data or write scripts against the data. Some of them were FAA applications that we repointed, kept the applications running in the data center, but now they're pointing to the data that we're storing in our EIM. Some of the applications were rehosted. We literally lifted and shifted them into the cloud to prove that those applications could run with a minimal amount of O&M with a minimal amount of data migration and app migration. And finally, we actually wrote new, one, one or two new applications that took advantage of this new data that's available for us. I'll come back to that more in a, in a minute. Underlying this, for the data scientists in the room, remember, raise your hand high so you can get a job offer. Underlying this is the Hortonworks Big Data Platform. And we've wrapped this at CSRA for the last five or six years with an architecture called EasyBake, which simply adds user interface components, management components, but it's really true to open source and big data so that as new big data uh, releases come out through Hortonworks, we can continue to use this architecture. Our, our customer at FAA, our client, um, had used this architecture on a previous job said, I think that's what we need for EIM, and so we, we moved it over and began the implementation with a really big head start. Some of the tools that are listed here are part of the ecosystem. We have a Postgres relational database to store geospatial information so we can do searches based on time and space faster. We use Elasticsearch to do the, to do the text, um, text indexing and text searches. Uh, what else do I have listed here? MongoDB for the non-relational data. <clears throat> and Apache Storm and Spark for streaming information in, in real time. So we can take batch data and load it through NiFi streams, and we can take real-time real data and load it with um, Storm and Spark. All of this is on top of you know, a, um, a Hortonworks uh, data platform hosted in the AWS cloud on EC2 instances and, S and storage instances that we manage. So what does this all do for us? What's the result? Remember those eight data sources we had to bring together to understand a loss of separation event? In a few um, weeks, I think perhaps a month, our team built a new application to show how this data could be brought together in a compelling geospatial display so that someone doing analysis would have all the information prepared for them and then they could have it displayed in a meaningful way and replay the time that that incident took place. So we showed not only that we could repoint and rehost applications, but we could innovate and create new applications that hadn't been seen before. Now this gets us so far, but what's the next step? If we can analyze how these events took place with predictive analytics, machine learning algorithms, then we might be able to, in the future, forestall or prevent these loss of separation events. You can imagine that across a variety of event types that we'd be investigating. I just use this one as an example. So, what were the impacts? 
hey, we can take stovepipe data now, put it into a central repository, not throw any of it away, and we can link it through uh, data integration tools. Um, we can, one of the lessons we learned is that this, of course, um, require, is going to require a lot of data storage. So we have to look at our data storage models, take advantage of different data tiers. Um, so we learned that you just don't dump it all into an S3 bucket and hope for the best, because you'll go broke storing tens of terabytes per day. So we came up with uh, data tiering and data storage um, approaches. This enriched data frees up time for deeper analytics. The guys who built that user interface focused on two things, a compelling user interface and telling a story. They didn't focus on collecting data from 20 data sets or eight data sets. So they could spend more time analyzing data rather than collecting data. So the key benefits over time, we overcame the data deluge. We can rehost, repoint, and build new applications. And we can deliver valuable new insights on this platform, all on AWS. OK. So we've got a secure platform. We have a data platform. And we have loaded a rich collection of data that's now somewhat integrated. Let's explore now how we can analyze that data with high value, elastic, fully managed AWS services. We're going to focus now on platform as a service as opposed to where we were a moment ago with infrastructure as a service. And my last story that I'm going to share is with the, um, some of our uh, really <laughs> data-driven science-based clients. Our clients at NIH, uh, and, and, at NOAA, NASA, EPA collect uh, exabytes of data. And they do store them in databases for scientists to analyze, for our scientists to analyze, for academics to analyze, for reporting, and even publishing on public internets, uh, open uh, data.gov, even public, we can publish it through there. So this, this data science teams um, collect data, they build and they operate databases and data warehouses, and they analyze scientific data, even host high performance computing platforms, and of course, we provide IT, security, and managed services, right? So one of our uh, science, it's showing EPA and NOAA, yeah. So our EPA and NOAA customers publish this data to the public, and they face a similar challenge as FAA. They're looking for a secure cloud, plat cloud elastic analytic platform to integrate and analyze their data. So this year, we challenged some of our clients, climate scientists, to identify data and missions that we could leverage to improve um, environmental production, protection. And we did that on a secure platform where the storage and databases and serverless query, analytics and visualization are all, ver are all platform services. They're all managed, fully managed, and some of them are elastic. So I'll walk you through how we used the AWS uh, big data and analytic services to, to meet these challenges. So I, for, I, um, we leveraged the big data and analytic services shown here for collection. We do direct connects, bring data in from a different a data center into the cloud. Snowball for bulk data transfers. Kinesis streams for streaming data. And then movement, like migrating existing data. We use um, the data migration services to take existing schema, move them into the cloud so we can populate the data. And then we have a variety of storage. Some of it's unstructured, the S3 and Glacier, different temperatures, different costs. And some of it's highly structured, the Amazon RDS, the relational data structures, the Amazon DynamoDB. And we don't show it here, but Redshift as well. These are all services that are fully managed and available for data storage. And then on the analytics side, there's really no end, but we're going to feature Athena and QuickSight in our discussion today and machine learning. There's a variety of more tools available for analysis in this platform, but in our story today, we'll focus on that top line. Okay. 
So there's more than 185,000 public water systems in our country. And they range in size from the Chicago treatment plant out on Lake Michigan that serves more than 7 million people to smaller systems that serve 100. And they're all monitored. They're all monitored for um, contamination, poison, bacteria, um, contaminants, heavy metals. They're, they're all monitored on a periodic basis. And <clears throat> those test results for water samples are evaluated to determine if they're in compliance with some limits. There's limits set to how much contamination can be in the water. And all the compliance data is collected and stored on every water system every month. In compliance or out of compliance? Out of compliance, which rules did you break? And that data represents a rich collection of information about our public water systems. CSRA supports the curation and the publication of that data in the Safe Drinking Water Information System, SDWIS. And one of our water scientists in near Cincinnati, Ohio, proposed that we explore coliform contaminations in light of weather events. Because he, he knew that floods and runoff seem to be associated with bacteria being overwhelming intake systems. So that was, that was one of our um, climate, our water scientists supporting the EPA had this suggestion. And so, what well, the hypothesis, could we accurately predict the risk of a health impacting coliform violation? There's non-health impacting violations, like you forgot to turn your report in or you didn't do it correctly. But then there's the health impacting ones where the, the coliform content was so high that we had to take action because people were going to get sick. So we looked at those that caused health impacts and we said, could we find any relationship between that and weather data? So CSRA supports NOAA and we had the availability of some uh, local climate data. So we knew in every location in, in this um, region, Region 5, um, up in the upper Midwest, Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, we knew how much rain had fallen by month, how much snowfall, uh, how much, what the snow um, pack was by month, going back 10 years. And our data scientists um, assembled this data, and they merged it with the violation data to create a, a target data set. This data set now had independent variables which included the violation, the facility information, and the weather data. We stored that in Amazon S3, and we used the advanced uh, analytical services in S3 to explore that data. Two of the services I'm gonna highlight here are really cool because um, they're relatively new. One was announced last year at uh, reInvent, Athena was last year at reInvent, and QuickSight was two years ago at reInvent. And our cu government customers haven't begun to use these serverless services yet, or these services features yet. Um, and I wanted to help expose that to our government customers, and we're sharing that story with you here today. On the left is Athena. Athena has the ability to query um, structured data stored in simple files, S3. All we need is a comma-separated variable list, a comma-separated um, file or Excel. We can also read data from databases, from Hive databases, from relational databases, but the true magic to me is that it can read an unstructured CSV file, and we can apply a schema at the time we read this unstructured data, and then we can query it using standard H Hive query language techniques. So think about that. We're running a database query with no database system. We're not spinning up a database. We're not creating indexes. We're not storing, we're not maintaining a database. We're just storing data and running a database query against it that's ephemerally creating a Presto instance, and then when that instance is done, lets it go. So talk about removing all the middlemen. We don't have any security to worry about because we're on a secure platform. We have no databases to maintain because we're running a database less, a database less query. 
So that's my excitement on the left. That's kind of for the coders, right? You can see the text. It's select statements, and you can tell that this is for people who've written uh, in query languages before. On the right, I call those uh, coders, by the way. On the right is the world for the clickers. This is a place for people who maybe can't write software but can analyze data. And the clickers can use QuickSight, which is a data visualization tool. Some people might call it a Tableau lookalike, but not, I'm not one of them. Uh, but it's a tool that's available for pointing to S3 data stores, or relational databases, or Redshift, and probably 20 different data sources it can read. And you can build dashboards. You can drill into your variables. And you can explore your data. So we use both of these to explore our data to understand, do, did I collect all the data correctly? Did, is there patterns of revealed in this data? Is there one state? Or in this case, <laughs> is there one PWS that has more violations than others? And if you can, can't really see it here, it's not very clear, but if you see that sort of sideways Pareto graph, you can see there's, at the top, it's very, very long bar, and then it kind of rolls in. There's probably in the top 50 PWSs, uh, public water systems, in the top 50 probably cover 95% of all violations. So it, it, it brings up a valuable insight to people who are doing um, compliance and monitoring. Should we monitor those top 50 more often? Should we monitor the ones that have never had a violation less often? Is there a way to save some money from this observation that it's a Pareto diagram, 80% of the problems caused by 20% of the people, but in this case, it's even more severe. 95% of the problem is called, caused by less than 1% of the, of the water stations. So just, discover, just exploring data, we can derive useful insights. One of the more advanced analytical tools available on the, in the big data analytics services, AWS services, is called Amazon Machine Learning. And this is also a tool for the clicker, right? You don't have to be a data scientist to build a model. All you need to do is prepare that data set so that you have your independent variables and your target outcome. We used AML, Amazon Machine Learning, to build a model to see if it could predict um, when those violations would occur. In our model, our best model was about 80% precise and 61% recall. So that tells us that we have a lot more to learn and that we, we already know as a team we need to collect more data, we need to uh, refine the search distance, we need to be more specific about location. There's some elements of the data set that can be improved. And if we improve the data, we iteratively go back and collect and integrate more data, we can build a better model. But this model, as preliminary as it is, shows tremendous utility. We know precipitation impacts some, but not all, of the water stations. So that helps us in narrowing down treatments, helps us to recommend treatments in face of forecasts. So if we have a forecast for a rainy month, and that water treatment plant has habitually um, had issues, then we can take pre preventive action and keep our water safe for drinking. And in the long run, this could be used as a, as a tool to prioritize capital improvements by these pu public water systems. The cool thing about Amazon's machine learning is we, uh, we're data scientists. We prepared the data set, and we let it go. But we couldn't really see behind the curtain. That's a, that's a good thing for data, citizen scientists, maybe business analysts. And it gets us so far. And it opens up the door to analysts um, citizen scientists to be able to apply um, good algorithms to data to find new insights. Challenge number two. So I mentioned that CSRA uh, leadership asked their employees to look at data and missions and see if we could uh, bring the two together using advanced analytics. And um, one of our uh, one of our young uh, scientists down in um, Charlottesville, Virginia, proposed this challenge. Can we identify fuel economy label errors? 
You guys all remember the Volkswagen diesel emission fraud? So that was a fraud. Well, in fuel economy labels, every year they're submitted for every automobile make uh, and model. Sometimes there's labeling errors and the economy ratings are relabeled. So we don't know if it's by design or by accident. In either case, it has to be repaired. Why? Because fuel economy is a determinant for how people cho would pe consumers choose which car, auto which car type they choose. But also, there's a legal issue for fleets that have to meet mandatory averages by federal law and some state laws, California in particular. So if there's any um, mistakes, um, it would be great to have a model that could identify those and, 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 invest and um, help eliminate them. So our hypothesis here, can we, given the examples of relabeled cars can we, and non-relabeled cars, can we develop a predictive model? You can see we built a pretty thin model. The attributes that were used pri primarily describe a car's physical characteristics. And the biggest determinant is how many cylinders you have. Everybody, anyone who drives a four-cylinder knows you get better gas mileage than an eight-cylinder, right? Um, but there's still some issues around weight and type of carburetor and valves and things like that. Not a big data set. Even that thin data set, we prepared it. Um, uh, our, our data scientists worked with our uh, fuel economy scientists. They worked together. They tried a variety of algorithms, variety of data preparation techniques, standardizing the data, um, creating um, um, a variety of approaches and they discovered that the best algorithm was recursive partition tree, and that's not available in AML. In fact, all of this discussion here, choosing the algorithms, that's behind the curtain. Can't do that with AML, with Amazon Machine Learning. So how did we do it? We used an Amazon data science image. It's called the Data Science Linux Amazon Machine Image, AMI. So now we're spinning up an image that has built into it 20 different data science tools, including R and RStudio. And RStudio is an open source, community-driven collection of st statistical and data mining, machine learning, AI um, algorithms that are um, useful in, in building, building a variety of data analytics solutions, but in particular, building this predictive model. So we used RStudio, and we were able to build a model that was 97% precise and 91% recall. So it's detecting almost every relabel and it's not making a lot of false positives. So when this happens, that means that the EPA can send out a, a nice note saying, hey, we're not sure that these ratings are uh, correct. You want to double check? And they don't have to send that note to every car manufacturer. They don't have to send that to, they don't have to investigate and put it up on the bench. Or if they do want to put it on the bench, they have far fewer cars that they need to um, run the tests on. They don't put it on a bench, they just do some mileage tests. All right, so again, simple data set, powerful machine learning tools running in the AWS cloud, and we're able to provide value to our um, EPA mission. And what didn't I just say? So this platform expedites new analytics and it enables people of all levels, scientists, data scientists, business analysts, citizen scientists, to um, examine data and apply advanced al algorithms, do so without databases, do, do so with serverless functions, and really um, focus your energy and time on analytics instead of on infrastructure and security. So I think I've walked you through the story of our data analytics platform. It starts with a secure platform, it adds data integration, so we can store large amounts of information, so, and we have to be careful how we treat that data. We persist it or we keep it ephemeral. We might, we might analyze it on the fly or we might store it. We have advanced analytics, streaming analytics, the ability to build predictive models, to do machine learning, and we do all that on a platform that's elastic it's managed, and it's full of a very rich array of services. So 
So with the advent of the cloud platform, we see a future that enables more people to perform deeper analytics with more data much more rapidly. We see further, we see self-service and AI-based tools disrupting traditional data integration and analytics, both tools and approaches, and we expect those to be part of the AWS service catalog at some point. They're not there yet. AWS Glue is coming along. We see AWS as a provider of these services on a secure and a managed and a scalable platform. And quoting Mr. Uh, Gibson, the future is already here. So. At CSRA, we deliver innovative next generation solutions. And by leveraging AWS's big data and analytic services, we deliver advanced solutions to clients that rapidly impact their missions. And we do that today. At CSRA, we think next now. And with that, thank you. And I'll open the floor to any questions. Anyone? Yes. Um, I noticed on the, you know, the third example, you're using R, basically R Studio, and yes. then on the prior one, Athena. When you pick one over the other in terms of, you know, what's right for what situation? Sure, when we use R versus when you use Athena. Athena is a uh, programming language that, um, b by being hosted in the cloud, it, then being able to hit um, data of all, all types, including uh, CSV files, um, we're able to write queries and not have to worry about data integration. So we could use Athena to do quick exploration. It's useful for people that want to get to the data faster in a, in a, query, in a structured query way. R offers structured query and analytics and a deeper set of algorithms, a richer supply of algorithms. But in contrast, if you were going to use an R uh, algorithm, you'd need to bring the data into a data framework and then manipulate the data there before you could run your query or your, data, your visualization or your data um, analytics. So one is a fully functioning data programming language, data analytic programming language. The other one is primarily for query, and it leaves a lot of the maintenance, and a lot of the services are provided for you. Thank you. Yes? Question. On the, uh, your first use case involving FAA traffic, uh, probably don't need it, but what the heck. Yes. Uh, is that u using, uh, which flavor of AWS? Is that EC2, GovCloud, or C2S? Gov is that right? actual flight data? Yeah, it's uh, GovCloud, right? Yeah, it, it's uh, GovCloud, and it's using actual flight data, yes. It, in order to build the pilot, we took a barrage of data, a deluge of data, I like to say, for a particular time period, and we loaded up, um, I think it was probably three months' worth of data, 20 data sources. Do you remember the total number of terabytes we stored? Hundreds. Yeah, hundreds of terabytes. It's not active, it's now moving into phase two, and we're gonna move it to production and begin to ingest all of those data sources. So that'll be a hybrid with their, uh, their on-prem systems and yep. air traffic control will utilize that? Will air traffic control use that? No, this isn't, um, this won't be a um, production system for managing traffic. It'll be a data collection point and analysis. However, at the point when in the future we can make predictions on this data stream, you might want to build an application that sends something out to an air traffic controller or a pilot or somebody to take some action or not take some action. So that's the vision for the future is to not just do retrospective analysis, but to discover some insight to take some action. Yeah, thank you. Yes? How would uh, an agency start this data analytics training program for data analytics? How would an agency start using um, data analytics, right? Yeah. So um, you could start anywhere. You need to have your secure platform, you need your authority to operate. Take advantage of the AWS certifications, GovCloud and the, and the FISMA certifications. GovCloud's a great place for some of our customers to start, commercials, good enough for others. But what, we, what I would recommend, is that you start at the top and then work your way down. Start with the highest level services that get the job done. Don't lift and shift your Oracle database that does analytics, unless you have to. 
Right? Start with an Amazon RDS instance to store data for analysis. So I would say start at the top, work your way down to the point where you have to start to take on infrastructure to the point where you, you have to move over your own licenses for things that Amazon doesn't offer. And if Amazon does offer a counterpart, you know, explore that and pilot those ideas. I would, that's how I'd recommend it. I wouldn't say that you're gonna necessarily um, replace everything with AWS services, but you can replace many things with AWS services. Yes? What's your disaster recovery strategy? Recovery strategy? Yeah, disaster recovery. Well, so, so I'm gonna just, I'm gonna punt on this and say, um, I'm in AWS, <laughs> right? They have disaster recovery, they have the ability for us to build our own or we can rely on theirs. For, uh, for the FCS, do we have an explicit service that does that? Glacier? Glacier is our, Glacier is our persistent store for recovery. And because GovCloud is only in one region, Thank you. like one West region, it's yeah. not in any other region. Right. So how do you, you know, distribute the load in case, you know, something catastrophic happens? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, but multi is in the region. Sure. So, so, in the same region. That's kind yeah. of constrained the uh, top part. Yeah. yeah. Right. Stephen, thank you for sharing that. Stephen O, um, one of our cloud um, um, engineers. There are limitations to the uh, infrastructure, as I understand it, in GovCloud that are becoming, they're being overcome. And how are they being overcome? By demand. If you, as a, as a public sector, either system integrator or customer, need a particular feature, they're listening, and that's the place uh, to make that argument. Failover for loads, is different than recovery of data, and those are treated differently. So the, the availability of an S3 system, when it, if, if it ever um, stopped working in one zone, you need it in another zone. So I, I don't have the, I'll just stop there before I bury myself. Stephen, Stephen answered it well. He said that GovCloud is looking for a second zone. periods for disaster recovery, so it really is dependent upon what the, yeah. um, the risk profile is for the agency. Okay, um, good. Any, I, yeah, very good. Thank you, Stephen. Yes. Just a correction. Yes. You mentioned that, is, you mentioned that uh, Athena is auto-recognizing your CSV data or whatever. C Athena, CSV, yes. great. Yeah. What about more hierarchical or proprietary data formats that may not be as transparent or easily... Sure you know, figured out like CSV? So, so the lingua franca for data analysts is typically CSV. The, the, most people put their data into a table or row-oriented um, component. To do data science, we take... Not at NASA. Well, well, <laughs> look, 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 we'll show, sure, sure. For those work streams that have complex objects, embedded objects, hierarchical objects, usually expressed with JSON or XML, we, we have to reshape that data. We need to change it into a format that makes it amenable for analytics. So uh, does Athena, can Athena read JSON? I think, it, I don't believe there's a surety for that. I don't believe there is, but there could be, so don't quote me. Serial, dis serializer, deserializer. Okay, other questions? We have a minute to go if anyone has, a yes. So you showed some examples of using QuickSight and Athena. What new AWS services are you looking forward to using? Ah, new services for the future. Well, first of all, I might have mentioned it in passing, but Glue, ETL, data governance, data lineage, so that we can do our reshaping of data uh, with a higher level tool. And you saw how we had to punch out of Amazon machine learning and go to the um, Linux machine image. So we're instantiating infrastructure and we're running um, deep uh, programming tools, our programming tools, it would be nice to see a service, a data science service that was somewhere in between. So we could build models and evaluate them using AWS services rather than having to punch on through down to R or Python or Scala or Apache, Spark, one of those programming languages. It would be nice to have some more support for the, the clickers in data science. All right. 
Thank you very much for your time and attention and great questions.